Well, it continues to be a remarkably special moment in our life and in this morning's worship. I'm so pleased and happy to introduce to you Bishop Yvette Flunder of the City of Refuge, its founding pastor, its uh, current teacher and senior minister. I feel especially privileged this morning because in our emails together she writes me and calls me this, hi sis. <laughs> and this morning, just this very minute, one minute ago, she called me angel. So I'm having a great Sunday. I don't know about you all. <laughs> Yvette is the presiding bishop also of the fellowship, which is an organization and a body that Jim Matulski will take a moment to introduce you to in just a bit. And I have wonderful news. The City of Refuge congregation is moving to the East Bay sometime soon. From the So today is not only a special moment, I think it's the beginning of uh, what we might call a beautiful relationship. Yeah. Welcome Yvette, welcome all of you who are here with Yvette to support her and who are in our congregation. We are thrilled that you are here and we feel so blessed today with your presence. And I'll ask Jim to talk a little bit about the City of Refuge. Well, this is an exciting day, not only because we have the Bishop of the East Bay, Pat DeYoung, welcoming the Archbishop of the West Bay, without <laughs> wonder, but because we celebrate a new relationship, a history being made. How often does church change? You know, every 500 years, like clockwork, right? So the Holy Spirit is doing something genuinely new. The United Church of Christ, at its recent synod, formalized our covenant, a two-way relationship between the United Church of Christ and the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, uh, which is the, the gathering of churches that uh, Bishop Flunder is the presider over, churches that are largely African-American, largely LGBT or same-gender loving, always committed to justice for GLBT people, to racial justice, and to people with HIV AIDS. So for the United Church of Christ and for the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries to say, you know what, after thinking about it, we like each other. This accord is not an ending, it's a beginning of a united witness in church and even in our churches, because our liberation work isn't necessarily already done, right? And then in the world, we will stand together more visibly more proudly and more equipped because of this historic relationship that we are seeing made flesh today for the very first time since it uh, was signed uh, at, in Long Beach. And what better place than First Congregational Church of Berkeley to show the world this is not just a policy statement. Yeah. We are going to change the world. And this is what it means. In the ways of real covenant and relationship building, each group brings something to the table here. And one of the great gifts of the fellowship to the United Church of Christ, and we celebrate this today, is that it is reminding the United Church what it was conceived of, what it was imagined to be. Not united, but uniting. Not in the past, but something that's happening here and now and still happening and still revealing. So no more united church. Let's be uniting church. And what better place to model that than here and now today. So would you welcome after we hear the scripture, Bishop Yvette Flunder. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. What a joy it is to be with you this morning. God bless you, First Congregational Church of Berkeley. It's important to be specific. <laughs> <laughs> and to my family here, to City of Refuge, those of you that got up and came on out, God bless you. To all of those of you whose faces I know from PSR, 
from the community roundabout. It's just good for me and for us to be here together. I want to say to Phil, who, as I understand, made this wonderful stole that I have on today, that I am uh, trying my best to talk uh, your pastor into just letting me take it with me. I've offered her money. <laughs> And we'll see how it works out. We'll see how it works out. I don't have a clear and definitive yes just yet, but if you all pray, it is possible. <laughs> this is an incredible day. And it's an incredible weekend all over the United States. I am actively involved in what we are calling today, We Are Trayvon. At our worship service at City of Refuge this afternoon, we'll be wearing hoodies. And we're wearing hoodies because it's important that we identify with much of what is happening right now in our country and in our world. It amazes me how one young black boy, how his death and his life could spark the kind of response that we're experiencing in our country right now. But somehow or other, I see God in it, and I see good in it. And let me say this to you. I live with a beautiful black baby boy. He's my grandson, and he's three years old, and he's perfect in every way. Even when he's wrong, he's right. And he has a full set of drums. His godmother, Ann Jefferson, who you know well, bought him a full trap set <laughs> with a high hat, with a tom tom, with a snare. And he plays the drums. Now, he's getting better, but. It can be challenging in my house at times, as he is a drummer in process. <laughs> and when he plays the drums, and I often share with my congregation, he says, after a while, I need to play the drums for somebody. He says, Grandma, I need to play the drums for somebody. And it continues to resonate in my mind because after a few minutes of playing by himself, he realized that drums are not good to play alone. Yeah. Who wants to play drums just for themselves? The whole idea is that drums are for keeping rhythm. Keeping rhythm somehow suggests somebody ought to be clapping, or somebody ought to be dancing, or something ought to be happening. And so he says to us, he says, here's a stick for you. And I'll keep a stick. And then he beckons us to come over and he'll sing one of the songs in his repertoire. And he has quite a repertoire. Itsy Bitsy Spider <laughs> ran up the water spout. Down came the rain and flushed the water out or the spider out or something. And then he has another one. All night, all day, angels watching over me, my Lord. And he has a, several songs, some in English, some in Spanish, some in Yoruba, and we go through the whole ritual, the whole repertoire of his songs, with him beating with one stick and one of us beating with the other stick, because drums are not good to play alone. And sometimes when I'm sleeping, I'm napping, he'll climb up on my bed or get on my chair and he'll say, Grandma, Grandma, <laughs> open your eyes. <laughs> and if I don't open my eyes, he takes his fingers <laughs> and he pries my eyes open. And then if I close them, he'll come back and pry my eyes open. His other godmother is here today, <laughs> Minister Joy Rowan, and so she bears witness to this. He'll pry your eyes open. His intent is that I see him and notice him. 
And what may on its surface appear to be obnoxious behavior is simply asking me to open my eyes and to pay attention to the things that concern him. And the other thing that he does is he says to me, when we are going through a scary place, and a scary place is sometimes just walking through a supermarket or being among people that he doesn't know, he says, hold my hand, Grandma. And he says to me, you'll be all right. <laughs> hold my hand, Grandma. Because getting through the scary place means reaching out. It's important that we not <coughs> be alone in a scary place, yes. playing like we're strong. And so he doesn't play strong. He just pretends that I need the help. So he says, hold my hand, Grandma. You'll be all right. What will it take, brothers and sisters, for real change to take place in this allegedly post-racist society that we live in. First of all, we cannot do it alone. Secondly, we have to pay attention. And finally, we must hold on to one another through the process. This is what is in the air. I've been in conversation in the last couple of weeks with African-American folks and many different kinds and brands of Christians and people of indigenous faith and people who are Jewish and folks of every culture and race and ethnicity who see the injustice of both the law and the verdict that came out of Florida. We just left the convocation of the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries and in our convocation we heard the voice of our sisters and brothers who are Buddhist, our sisters and brothers who are of religious science, our sisters and brothers who are metaphysical, our Yoruba, our Kemetic, our Lugumi, our Native American faith, brothers and sisters, and we came together and worshiped a common Christ. What an incredible time this is. The place where the hue and cry against this injustice is not specific to any color or any religion or any group of people. What an incredible moment this is in history. Our President Obama said the other day, and for those who resist the idea that we should think about something like these stand your ground laws, I just ask people to consider that if Trayvon was of age and armed, could he have stood his ground? on that sidewalk? And who do we actually think that, or do we actually think that he would have been justified in shooting Mr. Zimmerman, who had followed him in a car simply because he felt threatened? Our answer, of course, would be a resounding no. I had a conversation with the Council of Churches, and they said that Religion has contributed its own biases. In 1901, the Bible published at the time of Jim Crow, the segregation laws in America noted that African people deserved the status of slaves since they were believed to be the descendants of Ham, the son of Noah, whose post-flood transgression of seeing his father naked was obliquely laid out in Genesis 9 25 through 27, and many denominations, such as the 19th century Southern Baptist Convention, accepted these biblical directives as the mandate for slavery, and I might add that they just apologized about it about 10 years ago. Too little, too late. Evolutionists largely a white populace also grounded in Christianity, emphasize instead the New Testament message of inclusion and equality about overcoming differences and finding unity. Galatians 3.28 still says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, 
There is no male or female. How about this? There is no gay or straight. There is no black or white. But we are all one in Christ. And that commitment carried large numbers in the faith community of all races right into the civil rights era and into the present. But my heart grieved because I got a note from an African American and Latino father. He's a mixed race brown man. And it's an anonymous note, and so I'll keep it anonymous. He said, My heart and my head ache this evening. My son turned 15 last week, and he's having a belated party tonight. He asked me if he and his friends could go outside this evening and play cops and robbers with his Nerf guns. My stomach lurched, and the cold fingers of fear grasped at my throat when I imagined my dark son dressed in a hoodie, running through the streets of our neighborhood. With my dry mouth and my wet eyes, I angrily told him that he could not go outside and he could not play a simple neighborhood game. I hope that he knows I'm not angry with him, but I'm infuriated with the world I'm raising him in. I'm angry at myself for limiting my son and denying him his youth because I'm petrified of what may happen to him for LWB, Living Wild Brown. Yes, I'm angry that black and, black and brown boys are always seen as a threat and never as the joyful kids I know them to be. The verdict in the Trayvon Martin case has caused so much pain for so many, and my family grieves tonight. We mourn not just for Trayvon and his family, but for the loss of innocence and freedom that every black and brown kid must endure because of this verdict. I believe that the voice of the Collegium of the United Church of Christ should be present in our conversation today. The Collegium of the UCC, two straight white men, one gay white man, one black man, and one really bold Latina. They asked the question, how long, O oh Lord? And as people of faith and as the United Church of Christ, the ground upon which we stand is the presence of the kingdom of heaven. We hope and we work for the beloved community where all God's children thrive and live abundant lives, free from violence and free from hatred. Our foremost thoughts and prayers today are with the members of Trayvon's family who have lost their beloved child to racially motivated gun violence and who must now bear the additional weight that the perpetrator of this crime will not be held accountable. May they be blessed with courage, endurance, and the assurance of God's continuing love. The acquittal of George Zimmerman exposes once again the deep wounds of racial polarity in our society and the embedded flaws in our criminal justice system. And we as leaders of a denomination that has long stood for justice and racial equality, we are compelled by our faith in the still-speaking God to ask many more, how many lives, how many innocent lives must be sacrificed? How many more Trayvons, or Amadou Diallos, or Emmett Tills, before it becomes clear that our nation's judicial, judicial system is neither just nor inclusive when the lives of people of color are at stake? How long, beloved? How long must our children and our communities fall victim to the violence of a gun culture and gun laws that will sanction that will sanction that will sanction the killing of our children? This is not only a disturbing historical wrong, but a stark living contemporary reality rooted in racial bias and racial profiling. 
I said to you that I am the grandmother of a black baby boy. And his chances of surviving until adulthood are very slim in our country right now. His chances of not being in prison are very slim in our, cu our culture and our country right now. We must act as individual congregations, as people, as a denomination to engage fervently in our own sacred conversations on race and racism, to expand solidarity with our sisters and brothers who, out of sheer necessity, must teach their children how to walk, how to talk, and how to behave so they won't become targets of violence and racial hatred. Now, now is the time to challenge our lawmakers, put them out, vote them out, talk them out. It's time not just to give lip service, but it's time to go in our attics and get our protest signs down. Time to get in the street again and make the kind of noise that brings about change. It's time to change our court systems and stop them from making racially based decisions. I declare to you, there is a fresh synergistic just justice movement being born. And what I learned, because I'm a mama, that once a child is born, it cannot return to the place it was born from. <laughs> There's no going back. My daughter's birth was a little complicated. We had some forceps involved and a great big tall German sister that put her hands in my belly and she said, I'm going to push, but you got to push too. She said, because your baby is transverse and she is not coming with the part of her head that concaves and makes birth easy. So I'm going to push, but you've got to push too. And the doctor was down there <laughs> looking like a catcher at a, <laughs> at a baseball game, you know waiting for my daughter to be born and they turned her a little bit with the forceps and out she popped. And I declare to you that once we got her out, there was no going back <laughs> Too much trouble to get out. Too much effort to get out. Too much struggle to get out. Too much work, too much, too much to get out. But once we're out, we're out. And I want to say to you, sisters and brothers, this is a time for a new birth. It's a time to come out as justice people. It's a time to come out as people who are against race hatred. It's a time to come out as people who are against homophobia. It's time to come out as people who understand we need to be against gun violence and the violence against our planet. It is time to come out. And once you're born, hallelujah, you can't return. Once you come out, you can't go back. First, because life's delivery systems change immediately. No more placenta. You only have a few minutes to start breathing air. You started in the morning swimming, but you end the, in the end of the day breathing. First, because the delivery system changes. And secondly, because the instant that we come out, we begin to grow. Hallelujah. The instant we come out, we begin to grow and change. And now we will no longer fit where we once did. Hallelujah. A bird cannot fly till it breaks its shell. But once the shell is broken, it must fly. And it must fly soon because the nest alternatives change and pass away. We're looking beyond what I call unnamedism, lookism. 
lookism, judging people by how they look, judging black boys by how they look, judging white men by how they look, judging our sisters and brothers, our croning mothers and fathers, suggesting that they haven't the ability to work gainfully, judging by how they look. Lookism is a very dangerous thing. Lookism judges people. So how does a bishop look? <laughs> In my hearings, the United Church of Christ, just before we went before the floor with our agreement and covenant, between the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries and the United Church of Christ. There was a brother in the hearing, an African-American brother, and said, the whole idea of bishop bothers me because it brings up for me, again, a time of oppression when I endured in the black church oppressive theology and hierarchical ideas and leadership models. And I said to him, I said, yes, brother, but let me share this with you. I'm a woman, I'm black, I'm a lesbian, and I'm a bishop. Something has changed. Something, something, sisters and brothers, has changed. Lookism, how does a teacher look? How do the wealthy look? Sisters and brothers, all the rules are being broken. And the prophet India Iree said, I am not my hair. I am not this skin. I am the soul that lives within. Finally, let me leave this with you. First Corinthians, the 11th chapter, where we get the institutional words for communion. It's a lovely thing, Paul said, in the King James, and you know this, the institution of communion and how we say it. And I've received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you. At the same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And I, I've heard it over and over again as a child, but what I like about that chapter is not up at the top, it's down at the bottom. Because down at the bottom is Paul's word to the church at Corinthians because they really were having the potluck from hell. <laughs> oh, it's the truth. The rich folks came early and they ate all the good food. Read it. And the working people got there a little late and when they came in, there was nothing left. But some greasy lettuce. Maybe you've had that experience before where <laughs> you came to the potluck and you were embarrassed that you didn't have enough money or resources to bring anything and it hoped that maybe the people would have left something for you, but you were in the disadvantaged class and you were not able to be there for the good stuff, so you got the leftovers. Somebody knows about that in this room today. Yeah. What it feels like not to be in the front of the line and when you get to the meeting, all of the decisions have already been made yeah. at the pre-meeting. Yeah. And when you get there, it's fixed, and all they're waiting for is for you to come in and assent to the decisions that have already been made. And I know maybe that doesn't happen in this church, but in some of the places where I've been, I've had that experience. And let me say to you that the frustration that Paul experienced with them was when they gathered to eat, they gathered with classism in their minds. And the consequence of that was, many people were left out of the good part. And this is what he said. He said, brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, wait for each other. Oh, there's a theology right there that we need to breathe into this culture that we're in right now. Brothers and sisters, when you gather, those of you who are privileged, wait. What does it mean, wait? 
Wait, we say in the community, down in the hood, down in the places where I work, slow your roll. Slow up just a little bit and look behind you and see who is trying to get where you are and can't get there because they came through poor schools and difficult environments and some of us have a little ways to go to catch up. How dare anybody say that affirmative action has affirmed everyone yet? It's not true. We got a ways to go before all things are equal. Wait! And whoever is hungry, Paul said, eat at home. <laughs> so that you don't have to bring judgment upon yourself by not doing right by your brothers and sisters. Oh, there's a principle there. Communion, my beloved, is about being together. We're doing some incredible getting together here of late. I am so inspired. I am so deeply humbled and deeply touched by the coming together. My standing in this pulpit is an indicator. Yes. On a Sunday like this, of our coming together. There's a together spirit that is hovering over us. It's in this room. It is the spirit of the many-breasted God, the Shekinah, she, hallelujah, who knows what it is to draw all of her children to her breast and around the home and hearth and to love the hell out of us. She's in the room, and her presence, the communion, our being together, we must get our together ready before we get together. Anybody understand? What do you <laughs> got to spend some time? Paul said, eat at home. What does it mean? Eat at home, prepare for our togetherness by learning more about the other. You may not understand my journey. I'm a Pentecostal evolving Pentecostal in recovery. <laughs> so you may not understand my journey. I beat a tambourine and I dance in worship. Yeah. And I love the sound of a B3 organ. Yes. And I clap on the two and the four. So you may not understand <laughs> my journey. You may not understand what it is to be raised by people who are the progeny of slaves. And you may not understand my journey. You may not understand hot water cornbread and pig feet. You may not understand or have a palate for chitlins. You may not even know what they are. Call me. I'll tell you about it. <laughs> there are things that you may not understand, but I also under don't understand haggis. <laughs> you belt a fish and blood sausage. Anybody walking with me now? I don't understand it or how anybody could eat it. I don't get it. It doesn't, but that's okay. Preparing before we come together means learning more about the other. Assume nothing. Assume nothing. If my black baby is going to be safe in this world, assume nothing. Assume nothing. Give him room. Give him space. Give him opportunity. Help him to survive. Correct him when he's wrong. But love him until he's right. Assume nothing. Because preparation means that we assume nothing. And that we prepare and we pray so that we'll be able to facilitate others when we get together. And then as an informed people, prepared to do synergistic justice. We will see justice run down like water, and we will see righteousness flow as a mighty stream. God bless you is my prayer.